Howdy! Welcome to this month's Theater Cues. I have an amazing guest today, but before we get into that, I think we should learn a little bit more about rock musicals. Shall we? I'll answer for you. We shall. In the 1950s and 60s, Hollywood was more hip with the times when it came to rock and roll in the media. In fact, it wasn't until 1960 when Bye Bye Birdie used elements of rock in its music. But Bye Bye Birdie didn't fully embrace rock music, but rather incorporated it in the style of the show. It then took another eight years before the first true rock musical reached Broadway. That musical was Hair. Hair adopted the, at the time, modern rock style, now known as 60s rock. Many groups covered songs from Hair and achieved Billboard hits, further escalating the popularity of the musical. After Hair, the rock musical industry exploded. As per Britannica, musicals like Your Own Thing and eventually Jesus Christ Superstar reached audiences in the wake of Hair. In the 70s, more hits emerged, like Grease and The Wiz, providing a window for more rock musicals, like Dreamgirls in the 80s and Rent in the 90s. Due to the massive popularity of these shows, we now have musicals like American Idiot, Next to Normal, Heathers, Hairspray, and The Lightning Thief, the Percy Jackson musical, all of which incorporate rock influences in their soundtracks. Pretty cool, right? I think it's time that we rock on with our guest today. See what I did there? Rock on. I'm here all week. This award-winning singer and songwriter has achieved success as a part of the indie rock duo Ryan Hood, which has toured to three countries and the majority of the United States. In 2017, he helped create a ballet about notorious criminal John Dillinger. He's currently working with Saguaro City Music Theater to workshop Voyagers, a space rock opera, his first musical, which he wrote. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to you directly from the realm of rock musicals, please welcome Cameron Hood. We fell in love and we left the ground, burning through the stages at the speed of sound, like we were Ganymede and Io and Europa bound, feeling bo So first off, introduce yourself and some of your... Uh, career greatest hits i guess career greatest hits so i'm cameron hood i'm one half of a folk rock duo called ryan hood we're based out of tucson we've traveled all over the country uh some around the world and we've put out like eight albums or something like that been totally independent uh high energy lots of harmony uh lyrics about personal growth and transformation and we won an International Acoustic Music Award uh, in 2014 for Best Group or Duo. Um, that might be the only, well, we've won a couple of like Tucson Area Music Awards and stuff like that. Um, so I'm a longtime veteran of touring music and the music industry, but I'm sort of a, a newbie to theater. I've loved it for a long time, and I was a... Uh, like a kid actor in like child's performing theater when I was like 12, 13 or something like that. It wasn't serious. It was just like a thing to go do. <laughs> I played P.T. Barnum one time um, before nice. there was The Greatest Showman. It was just like a, a bio show about P.T. Barnum. Uh, I played a knight in one show where I sang a song called I Will Do the Dragon In. And then <laughs> the best was that I played in a Christmas show. The show was called Jack's Giant Christmas. And I played Santa at the end, and I come on at the end and sing White Christmas, and it snows in the theater. So that was like my, I was like so awesome. dazzled, you know. But it's, okay, <laughs> so all to say, like, that was my previous experience with theater, you know, it was just like being a little kid actor, wide-eyed, and um, singing these songs in it. And then um, Voyagers is my first musical but the, the one other thing that I've worked on is a, a dance show, a modern ballet called Surrounding Dillinger. There for a long time was a dance company in Tucson called Artifact Dance Project. And their, their big thing was that they were a dance company that would team up with local musicians. And they approached our band, Ryan Hood, and basically said, hey, we want to do a show about the life of John Dillinger. Tucson loves John Dillinger because um, it was here in Tucson that he and his gang were apprehended. There was a fire at Hotel Congress. Um, some of 
his sort of henchmen were like loading out money and weapons and somebody saw that and alerted the police and that's how mm. they ended up catching Dillinger for the first time. So Tucson loves Dillinger. That's why they wanted to do this show. And uh, they brought Ryan Hood on to do the music for it. And uh, I just really started to fall in love with the process of matching songs to scenes. Like um, in the past, you just like if you're coming from music, you just write a song. Your story is three minutes long. But mm -hmm. there exist concept albums where, you know, you string songs together and tell a story over the course of an hour or something. Pink Floyd's The Wall comes to mind. But this was my first experience with something like that. Stringing songs together that already existed from the Ryan Hood catalog to try to tell somebody else's story. And that was this immense challenge for me that was also like really interesting. So my brain just lit up kind of learning about story structure and how do you, what are story beats and how can people understand emotionally what's happening in the show, even though our lyrics are not about gangsters and bank bank robberies, you know. Interesting. What uh, if you had to say for Voyagers? Did you have like a uh, a musical that inspired you to style it in the way it is styled? Which, for the listeners who don't know, it's a a rock opera. A space rock opera is what I call it, which is like not really a thing. There's space rock is a thing, um, and rock operas are a thing. I think it's most styled after Pink Floyd's The Wall, that album, which okay. became a movie, and then it also became a touring rock show. And when they played this tour, um, they're, you know, they would be in big arenas, and they would be at the end of the arena, their big band setup and everything. And over the course of the show, they would actually build a wall between them and the audience. So by the time they got to intermission, there was a big, massive white wall separating them from the audience. Oh, wow. Because the story itself is about alienation and feeling like disconnected from people and um, how in the story, it's basically how fame separates you from real people. I would say it's how childhood trauma separates you and that manifests in, in the way that the character like experiences fame. But uh, in the second half of the show, they do all these projections on this white wall. It becomes this beautiful screen to like project uh, the sort of, inner world of the lead characters and then at the end of the show they topple the entire wall down and it's this big mess of bricks and everything and like the band and audience can see each other again i never saw that in person oh. but i love it and uh so this idea of like using music to feel loneliness and alienation and then also to use your staging to help the audience experience that as well like that really got to me so i think voyagers is like somewhere between Pink Floyd's The Wall and Hamilton. Awesome. <laughs> that, two completely different but equally amazing <laughs> works of music. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. So how did Ryan Hood start? How did you guys get started with music? Sure. We both went to University High School in Tucson, and we were in rival rock bands. We were one grade apart in rival bands. They had a battle of the bands at the school, and each of our bands was always <laughs> trying to win that because it feels really important when you're in high school to like have the thing that sets you out, you know, sets you apart, and like how you're going to make your mark. And so I think being in a band was that for us, and we each wanted to win the battle of the band. So there was this kind of healthy rivalry between us. Post high school, we just became friends. We still had our own bands, but we kind of kept in touch. And then when we each finished college, the bands that we were in were done. And he's like, dude, your band's done. My band's done. You got to move to Boston, and I know how we can make money. And I was like, what's the plan? He's like, we're going to be street performers. And I was like, ah, my parents are going to be very proud of the college education <laughs> that I have if I go be a street performer in Boston. <laughs> I'm in. So we moved, I moved out there. He was already out there because he went to Berkeley School of Music in Boston. And so we started street performing. We got discovered by a college booking agent while we were street performing. So then we sort of moved up to do colleges and kind of moved up from there to do venues and clubs and, and that sort of thing. Um, at some point, we uh, toured so much that we could live anywhere and we had uh, family here. And so we came back to Tucson and I love this city immensely. Um, so I'm glad to be here. I'm proud to be uh, to be from here. So anyway, Ryan Hood still tours and makes records and all sorts of things. But we've been doing it so long that we're both kind of interested in other things right now. 
Uh, my bandmate okay. is making uh, a solo album of instrumental music that's incredible. And so he's got my blessing on that. And I have his blessing to be pursuing Voyagers right now. Um, Very cool. Ryan Hood has been, been the main squeeze for a long time. So you guys won an award, right, as you mentioned, at the 2014 International Acoustic Music Awards. That's right. Uh, what was that experience like for you guys? What was like, that's a, that's a pretty big stage to be performing on. So there was not like a um, an awards ceremony that you might think of, like, you know, like with the lights and the do 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 you know, like <laughs> cameras and everything. It was something that we submitted for a song that we were really proud of and put this song in. And, and it's with you're, you're going against people from all over the world. Um, and our song Sickbed Symphony won that. So it was a huge sort of boost to us um, to win that Um just to kind of be recognized on that that large of a like against competition that that wide and it's become like a cool a cool bragging right since then cool so you mentioned earlier that you uh and the other half of ryan hood uh ryan david green uh helped to make the music for surrounding dillinger which was you know praised by the arizona daily star and and um really well received around here so how did that come to be how did you you know get interested initially in in john dillinger and his gang it was entirely because the dance company artifact wanted to do that show about him and they approached us and said we want to tell the human side of john dillinger ryan and i kind of said well our, our music doesn't sound like the 30s. You can find a band who's kind of got that like hip upright bass, you know, swagger, the speakeasy mm -hmm. feel like you could find that. And and um, Ashley Bowman, who was in charge of, of Artifact, basically said, I don't I don't want to do the expected thing about Dillinger. I want to explore his inner world. What was it like to be this guy? And that's what your songs do. And so I was, you know, flattery will get you everywhere, I guess. And, and she flattered us by saying that our songs explore the inner world in a, a meaningful way. So we agreed to do it. And then for a long time, she was just kind of building scenes like she had a certain song of ours that she wanted to build a scene for. So she's like, OK, boom, I'm going to drop in and do this little uh, love story moment between John Dillinger and um, the lady, the main lady whose first name was Billy, and I can't remember her last name, um, but she was just kind of assembling a scene here, a scene there, and working on the choreography, because that's her great skill and her great passion. And I checked in with her and was like, do you have like an overarching script that that I can see? And she's like, oh, I'm, I'm working on that, I'm working on that. But I think she just didn't really have one. And I just sort of asked, like, would you be open to me stepping in and seeing it seeing if I can take a crack at it. And she was like, oh my gosh, yes, I would love that. That would be wonderful if you want to do that. And so I, I don't, it's weird. Like I'd never done that before. So I, I don't, it's not like I know how to write a libretto, you know, like at that point, like I know a lot more <laughs> mm -hmm. about it now. I just was interested in it. That was just the key is that, that I just felt like stories make sense to me and the arc of stories um, is really important and they follow a pretty basic structure, you know, um, regardless of whether it's theater or ballet or movies or TV or um, a whole season of TV, like there's always an arc and there's always, you know, rise and fall and stuff like that. And that was always really interesting to me. So I just thought I could probably learn what I don't know here. And I started researching uh, like the two act structure of theater, the three act structure of movies. I started reading screenwriting books like well, I won't name any uh, here right now, but I started reading theater books, um, anything I could to just sort of go, what's the basic like rising and falling action that a dance audience is going to be able to understand from songs that were not written about John Dillinger? There's no dialogue in this show. So it's an, it's basically it became a jukebox ballet based on Ryan Hood's music um, <laughs> with none of the songs written about Dillinger at all and no dialogue. So I thought, okay, the emotional rise and fall of this has to be airtight. People have to sense, oh, this is when he's like uh, first getting drawn into the the world of crime, you know, and they have to see like, okay, we see why it's seductive and 
what's going to happen here? Then we see how when his first when his wife um, breaks up with him in uh, in jail, like the blow that that is the 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 divorce papers are served like while he's in jail and that serves to like lean him into the sort of criminal side of things rather than the gosh I want to get out of here so I can be with my wife side of things so you kind of get that sense of like uh, almost the catalyst the the catalytic moment or the the call to action almost is like when his uh, his wife divorces him and now he's called fully into this world of crime little things mm-hmm. like that so um I'm not, I don't even remember how I got started talking about that, but the main point <laughs> is that I love story structure and I just get so excited about the idea of trying to show moments uh, in ways that are intuitive, like so that you don't have to have dialogue. You can just observe it and kind of know where you are in the story just based on like your intuitive sense of how stories go. Huh. So like, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. It's fine. Well, you ever like watch a movie and you're like, um, wow, okay, everything seems to be going well. I know something bad is in the next scene. I don't know how I know that, but I just feel like things are going too well right now. Mm-hmm. Like there's a part of screenwriting called the midpoint where it's like a high point, often a celebration of some kind. Um, the the hero is usually kind of like fully into this new thing that they're doing. And then the next part of the movie is often called bad guys close in. Like, so whether those bad guys are actually like villains or they're internal to the character, you know, a, mm-hmm. a protagonist against themselves, that's when that stuff starts to happen. And they write movies and shows like this all the time. And we've seen it enough times that like we just kind of know. And so I wanted to tap into that, I guess, like the, the sense that everybody kind of knows when we're at that moment. Yeah, it's kind of like the, the calm before the storm, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I I was watching um I don't know if you're familiar with it but there's a TV show called The Good Place. Oh yeah. That's yeah. incredible. And that first episode, right? It's like everything is like super happy. You know, she walks into the to uh the main character's office and and they're they're talking and going back and forth about how she's in the good place, right? And then you find out later that there's something wrong. It's like that that whole like you know there's like a solid you know 15 minutes where it's like okay what's gonna happen something's gonna happen too good to be true yeah so you've also you're also a uh a speaker you've spoken at um tedx tucson uh what what is that experience like what is you know how how do you carry over what you've learned about storytelling and and writing a book for a show into speaking that experience is totally terrifying and harrowing and (laughs) i recommend it uh you should definitely nate you should do a ted ted talk if you get a chance um just i think it's something about like the first time you do anything is the hardest time of doing something and after that you kind of get your sea legs you know you you get muscle memory on things but um I had never given that exact talk before. And it also has to be a very specific amount of time that you have to fit this talk into. And we Hmm. were kind of coached, like, keep it. If it's under this many minutes, you have a better chance of not just being on the TEDx Tucson homepage, but, you know, the Big Ted homepage. So keep it under this amount of time. And so you're trying to be true to your art and your songs that you're going to play. You're trying to be true to the stories and the content that you want to tell and fit it under this exact time constraint so it was really challenging um to do and i was an absolute mess the night before doing it <laughs> but um I'm, I'm glad i did would i do it again i don't know i probably would because it's it's an honor to be asked um but it's uh yeah it was really harrowing the the way we landed ourselves there is that ryan hood shows are really storytelling heavy so you know, if, if you haven't figured out by now, like story arc is just like, I just live for it. I love to find those things. So if we're putting a set list together for a show, my bandmate is thinking entirely about the musical rise and fall that we're bringing people into, the emotional rise and fall. And I'm thinking entirely about the storytelling rise and fall. Like how are people meeting us? What stories from our past are we using to mm. frame which songs so that over the course of the show, there's this like, 
uh, narrative thread that you can follow. And then by the end, hopefully you're actually wrapping up some threads so that people's story loops are closed and they can go home satisfied, you know. So we're already doing that. And then a lot of the songs that we sing have introductions that have gotten longer and longer and longer over the years. Like <laughs> um, you tell, okay, the lyric of this song was inspired by this. So listen for this. Like when you're hearing this song, uh, listen for this little thing. And then people would come up to us afterwards and go, oh, that was so helpful that you kind of told us what that song was about and what to listen for. And it just grew from there. And um, I found that like when I as a speaker or a member of the band am on stage and I'm self-revealing, it it creates an atmosphere where the audience can be that way too. Where I'm self-reflective, uh, the audience can become self-reflective. So I often will tell these stories where I was not always the hero or where I learned something and then I'll just sort of go, now listen for that in the song. And they started to become a huge part of the show and, and pretty involved and pretty deep. And so we got asked to do the TEDx talk because some of our shows are, or some of our s stories are like, you know, here's how this breakup happened and affected me and uh, how I chose not to just blame uh, the woman that I was with, but actually chose to try to examine myself in this story. Now, pause. This next song is about an entire people group blaming another people group and choosing to pause there and self-reflect and not go into the blame game but instead like see what hmm. they could change so that's like a society-wide idea that just came out of a breakup song and so i think because we tell those sorts of stories that's why we got asked to do it and so our performance is two songs and two stories that that tie them all together that go from the very personal to the political do you do you find that writing songs and and telling stories is reflective for you uh as a person and for your bandmate absolutely i i won't speak for him but i i will speak for me and say that it's it's how i process life it's how i process excuse me um what's going on in my life and songwriting has always been that um once I started writing Voyagers, uh, I had a basic kind of arc. Um, I don't know if your listeners will know what this is, but maybe I should just give a little pitch about kind of what the show is. Um, sure, that would be great. Yeah, so in 1977, NASA launches these two Voyager spacecraft. Uh, there were, before them were the Vikings, the Pioneers, um, the Mariners, and they visit. They would visit the Moon, or they'd visit Venus, or you know, certain Jupiter even. Um, but the Voyagers were were planned to take advantage of this rare alignment of the planets, where they were basically like, okay, if we can launch a spacecraft in this time window, we'll be able to go to Jupiter and then swing around Jupiter in a move called a gravity assist, where you actually grab some of Jupiter's like orbital momentum uh, and swing around Jupiter. And the direction we'll head is where Saturn will be two years later. And so we'll just fly oh. to where Saturn's going to be. And then we interact with Saturn and we can study, take pictures, take all these scientific readings, and then swing around Saturn. And the direction that we head is where Uranus will be four years after that. And then they go and do the same at Uranus. They swing around and they go to Neptune. So they were able to see all four of the outer planets using this technique called a gravity assist, this kind of slingshot method. And the planets were just situated at this particular time that you could be able to do that with one mission, which was totally unheard of. So NASA being NASA basically says, cool, well, why would we do it just once? Well, we have to have redundancy in case anything goes wrong. We'll build two craft. And uh, they were only um, they were only approved by Congress to go to Jupiter and Saturn. But the engineers built them strong enough to be able to go the full distance, all four planets just oh, in wow. case, in case they were so successful that the public got on board and they were approved to go onto the, the, the further outer planets, which they were approved. And so they make it all the way out of the solar system. And that pathway that they followed gets called the Grand Tour. So it's the Grand Tour because they get all four of these planets in one go. And then they, the idea is that they would then study the boundary of the solar system, the 
It's called the heliopause, the actual place at the edge of the solar system where the sun's influence fades and you actually enter into the space between stars, or what they call interstellar space. So that would be the next step. And then at some point, uh, we're going to totally lose contact with the Voyagers. And the only thing that they'll be at that point is this sort of like hunk of metal flying through space, but they carry a golden record. And this record is like a time capsule of life on Earth. It's actually a phonograph record made of copper, plated in gold. And on one side, it has like Chuck Berry and Beethoven and Bach and music from around the world. It has greetings in 55 languages and whale languages. And um, on the other side, they figured out a way to encode images into the grooves of this, you know, old sort of vinyl type record. Um, they found a way to encode images on there too and then there's instructions for how an alien race might be able to actually play this they included like a little record needle in there also because <laughs> so the idea is if a million years from now there's another civilization uh, in the milky way that finds this thing they could snare it and bring it in and put this record on and understand something about what it was like to be human on earth in our time and even figure out you know what it looked like if they were able to decode those images so they went on the grand tour and they have a golden record and i was like i know this story i can tell a story about people who have a record and take it on tour so voyagers the musical the space rock opera follows two musicians a guy and a girl uh, we called them one and two who meet and record this album and undertake a grand tour with the goal to to go gold to like basically like win a gold mm -hmm. record and so on stage we're following these two humans in this very human story of ambition and the search to belong and wrestling with your family history and on screen this massive wide screen that's going to have these projections on it we're telling the space story so uh while uh, it, let's, let's see, let's give an example here. Uh, there's a song called Cape Canaveral Day, and this is the moment where they're actually leaving home. They're like doing their record launch party. They've been in the studio and they've recorded their album, and now they're going to do a record launch party and head out on tour. That's what's happening on stage with the humans, and on the screen behind them is Cape Canaveral, Florida in 1977, the actual day of the launch of the Voyagers, and the song itself has like the launch commentary, like you know, it's sort of like, this is Voyager Launch Control. Uh, the temperature is 88 degrees here at uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida. That's playing through the song. And the screen is going to have, like, the footage of the rocket launch and that sort of thing. So that's an example of, like, a little uh, pairing of how the two stories go together. Another one is that um, the guy and the girl kind of start going at different paces. He's really driven to try to succeed. And uh, we learn much later that he's out running like a very painful past with his father. That's what's sort of driving him and pushing him so hard. But she's this like this balancing factor in his life that's going slow down. Like, what's the point of any of this if you're going too fast to see it or to taste it? Like, be here with me, you know. And so they're actually sort of starting to move at different speeds. And that becomes the conflict uh, at the end of Act One is the different speeds that they're going at. And eventually... Uh, they break apart and he basically tells her like i'm worried like i can't slow down and go at the pace that you want to go i can't get married i can't do this whole like family life thing it's too scary for me i'm afraid we will duplicate what i saw growing up so he's basically like touching the ring finger on his left hand and going like gold rings are cold and quiet things i can't do this i can't stay confined here like you want to do or like he assumes she wants to do and at that moment where he's telling her about gold rings, cold and quiet things on screen, we're having our encounter with Saturn, which is the cold gold ringed planet, right? So the Voyagers are going to be hitting that planet at that point in the story. It's utterly littered with things like that, like these matchups between this human story and the kind of metaphor that plays out um, with the space story. So that's what Voyagers is. I'm totally in love with it. Awesome. So what inspired you to write Voyagers? I mean, clearly you, you know, you've known about the golden records. Was there like a trigger? Was there something that like pulled you in and was like, okay, I, I need to write a, a musical about this. 
That's a really good question. Um, I've always loved space. Um, I've always felt like something happens when you look at the stars for a long time. Um, like if you've ever had one of those nights where you just go out and look at the stars, you know, for for an hour or two hours or something, mm -hmm. you really feel small, but you also feel a part of things. It's a really weird thing. You feel insignificant and like a significant part of something really big and beautiful. And that's always affected me. And I started writing songs just generally about space um, years ago, probably 10 years ago now. I started writing some songs that were just like explorations of floating in space, that, that kind of thing. And then somebody said, well, if you love space, you should look into these Voyagers. Like they have this thing called the Gravity Assist where they spun around these planets. They have this gold record. It's really cool. Like you should look into it. So I looked into it and my brain just exploded against the wall in this beautiful way. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to take these songs that I've written and start steering them towards the Voyager story if I can. All I'm doing is writing an album. That's all, because that's all I had done was write albums. And so I'm like, cool, we're going to have a concept album here, kind of like The Wall, and it'll be about space, but it'll be about the Voyagers. So for a long time, it was the space album. But as it went along, and, and it was actually only from... Um, from a single point of view. It was from the singer, the male person's point of view, reflecting on this relationship that he had had and split apart with this girl at the gold rings, at the prospect of marriage, and, uh, and mm. all of his thoughts about that. And you can do that on a record. One lead singer often, you know, as all a band has, you get one perspective on it. Um, and he would, he would say, oh, I remember she said this, or I remember she said this. Uh, and then he kind of reflects on it. But what happened is that I realized when I'm home from tour with Ryan Hood, I don't want to go back out on tour with Voyagers. Like I don't, so I don't know that this just being an album that needs to be promoted through touring is what I want this to be. So it needs to be some other thing and it needs to be some um, immersive way that people can enter this story because our attention spans online are super short, right? If I go, hey, I've got 90 minutes of space album for you to listen to, you might go like, cool, I will really try hard to carve out 90 minutes of my Saturday to sit down and listen to that. Or maybe you go for a run and you put it on. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, people are not sitting down and listening to 90 minutes of music straight. So I was like, okay, I need some form where I don't have to be the person performing it and where it's super immersive and people can enter this story and won't think anything about sitting there for 90 minutes. I wish there were an art form like that. And I was like, oh, there is. That's what theater is. <laughs> Literally, theater is like this immersive, beautiful form where people sit in their seats in the dark and want to get immersed in a story. They want to turn off their own thoughts about the bills they have to pay and their um, person in their life who's wrestling with illness and they want to just go inside your story and like nobody expects that Elton John is going to be the person singing any of the Lion King songs you know on stage they know it's actors that are going to be up there doing that mm -hmm. and so all of those were like oh my gosh I wonder if this should be a musical if this is the right format for it so then the next step was to start to go okay what does it look like if these are scenes on a stage and this is not just a, a lead singer singing into a microphone with a band but there's actually scenes well the very first thing that was wrong with that was if you've got a guy telling you there was this woman in my life and she made this profound impact on me and i remember she said this and she said that you start going why isn't she here like why aren't we hearing from her why aren't we you you take it differently on a record but if you're seeing it on stage, you instantly want, just let me hear from her. Stop telling me about her. I want to meet her, you know, like let's, let's, let's meet her. And so then we started to go, okay, we can, we can do that. Um, let's give this song to her or this verse to her. And then we had this hugely imbalanced show where uh, the guy was singing like 80%. And then the girl was singing 20% of the show. And it was better the more that we brought her in. The more of her presence and um, her perspective that we actually got to hear from her, the more kind of audio difference, like um, like just to have a different voice singing in a different range and stuff. It just kept making it richer and richer and richer. The more we learned from her, the better it got. But I'm over here like 
getting sadder and sadder because while the show itself is getting better, some of my like favorite geeky lyrics about space are getting lost because there's like only so much real estate in a show, right? You can only have so many lyrics and unless you're Lin-Manuel Miranda, there's like a limit to how many lyrics you could fit in a show for the most part. So to expand her presence, that meant verses that he was singing went away and she would get that verse or a song that he sang would go away totally and be replaced by a brand new song from her perspective. And the show got better and everyone liked it better. And even I liked it better. But I was like, what about my little lyric that talks about there being 400 billion <laughs> stars in, in the Milky Way alone? And then there being 400 billion galaxies beyond the Milky Way. That's not in this project anymore. And, you know, I just like struggled with, you know, being precious about the things that I had written. I think I've done a good job, big, big picture, of consistently stepping back and going, okay, anything that doesn't serve this show and these characters is out. I don't care how much I like that song, it's out. The show needs to be good. If the show is not good and compelling, no one will listen to any of these songs. So better to throw out the ones you know that I need to and make the show better. So that's been the wrestling match. And then you asked earlier like kind of about whether the songs and the stories are from my own life and uh, or you know whether it's just a character that I'm writing and I said it's how I process life. And this lead character, the character one, the male character, is not exactly me, but he's not so different. Um, his past is not the same as my past. The wounds that he carries are not the same as my wounds. But it has been a chance at every turn to process the things I also struggle with. My own fear of commitment at the, gold, the prospect of gold rings and marriage. Um, my own inner fear that, like, I won't use my my abilities, my gift, my creativity uh, well enough in the time that I have. The very same things that drive this lead character are me working out like in real time, you know, the things that I also struggle with. And um, that's, I think, why I, why it's at least compelling to me. We'll find out whether it's compelling to other people, but it's, it's very real. It like it absolutely is facing things that are not just a writer going into a room going like, what could happen to these characters? They are absolutely the things that I wrestle with myself. And so, um, so yes, it's super personal and it's a way of processing my own life. Well, and so far it has been well received because you've performed um, some of the songs at like the Fox theater here in Tucson and with the uh, just recently with the Tucson pops orchestra. Um, That's right. And we've had yeah. we've had two, we've had three workshops total. So Voyagers is currently in workshops. There's nowhere you can see it um, yet. It, you can get little glimpses of it if you go to the webpage voyagersproject.com. But we've had three workshops, and the first one was totally private. It was just us with a pair of actors, kind of for the first time ever seeing what it looks like on its feet. Then the second one. Um, we actually showed the first 30 minutes to about 30 people just to like try out, is any of this working? Are we, do, are we, you know, are we headed somewhere good? And that was like a very powerful experience in my life to see that these 30 people got it. Like I, I got two really powerful pieces of information. One, we're on the right track and these people are getting it. Like it's, this is working. And number two, um, this female character is just following this male character around a lot. And she's like, we don't know enough about her yet. And like, that's boring to watch her do that. So we've got to hear, we got to know more about her. We've got to, you know, what I was saying earlier, it was like a huge wake up call to me that like, dude, it does not work if it's just about him. And she's like some, you know, prop in his coming of age story that does not work at all like we want to know her and I really got that information from the second workshop and then just a month ago we completed our third workshop and we showed this to a hundred people we showed the first hour to hundred people and we did it uh, with some basic lighting and we did it with backing tracks too um, so I mentioned earlier like there was the launch commentary from NASA that plays over Cape Canaveral Day and scientists mm -hmm. speak all throughout 
these different songs. And so I, we played the backing tracks so that as I was there performing on acoustic guitar, we're also interweaving these like various sound effects and uh, science tidbits and stuff like that. And again, like it was just like, oh, my gosh, this is working. We have so much work to do. But the good news is this is working. Like people get this. They're seeing the connections. And um, so so it has been well received, but there's like tons more to do. So I like to play a game with every one of my guests. So I've like kind of invented uh, a little bit of a game for us to play. And you already explained uh, a little bit about the golden record that was sent up and the things that were on it. So in this game, which I'll call For the Record, I'm going to name the title of five of the songs on the actual golden record. And uh, <laughs> you'll have to tell me who sang or created uh, each of the five songs. Oh, my gosh. And this is you're you're trying to, like, test my memory right i'm not i'm not meant to like have a little cheat sheet here and just give you like no. <laughs> fun info about it right you're actually looking it's a game it's competitive yep. all right Whew. Okay. all right so we're gonna i'm gonna start off with a with a uh a, a little fastball right down the middle here with uh, johnny oh, no. b good oh sure okay that's that's chuck berry and uh yes indeed that's like an er early rock song and snl like made a joke where they like showed the cover of time magazine and the aliens just say send more chuck berry because the <laughs> aliens love their chuck berry okay so that was a that was a, uh, an easy one uh the I second one is melon yeah <laughs> the second one is melancholy blues i want to say that that's louis armstrong it is yeah all right the third one is Dark Was the Night, Cold Was the Ground. Oh, man, that's such a haunting song. That's Blind Willie Johnson that sings that. Yep. Uh, number four is Symphony Number no. 5 in C minor. Oh, no. Oh, no. Does it have like a little, <laughs> does it have another signifier, like a, co a, a commonly known name? Uh, no, no, not really. That was... <laughs> That's the symphony, one. <laughs> symphony, wait, is symphony number five, is that what you said? Yes, yeah. Okay, so is that Beethoven? It is, yes. Okay. And then finally, number five is The Rite of Spring. Yeah, uh, Stravinsky. Yep. Wow, five right. for five. Congratulations. All right, I did better than I thought. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I think you, you started me off right by giving me Johnny B. Good at the top. Um, <laughs> so... Um, out of curiosity, how do you know how they chose the songs for the record? Um, there was a committee headed by Carl Sagan, um, and there was a record producer on that committee, uh, at least one. And there was a um, his future wife was on that committee, Ann Druyan. Uh, the record itself, as I mentioned, was like had a, had a bunch of functions so there was a like if you look at the cover of the record there's like this gold cover to keep it safe from like space debris and it has these kind of hieroglyphics on it that are like symbols that teach an alien race like our math using chemistry or, or hmm. physics oh boy i'm so like non-scientific for someone who loves space but it basically shows <laughs> like a state change of a hydrogen atom like a uh an electron changing state, I think, of a of a hydrogen atom. So the most basic building block, they go that state change, that's one. And so now now you know our math. So everything that we're gonna build is like off of our math, which you should have too, because you should know hydrogen wherever you are. And then they they teach you how to like play this record and like decode it and everything based on that math. Um, there's a, a famous map that kind of looks like a starburst, and that's like where the sun is positioned uh, in relationship to a bunch of uh, pulsars, which are these stars that kind of like pulse at, they're not actually stars, but these celestial bodies that pulse at a certain rate. And so those numbers are written on there too uh, in binary so that the race could go, you know, oh, this is where the earth is, you know, compared to, so they could potentially find us. And that was a controversial move also because they're like, why do you want to give aliens a map to earth? Like that's a, super bad idea but space is so big that like 
there's just hardly any chance that humans are going to still be here if if this were ever discovered and then they ever got here so that's like all that stuff is on the record then there's also all these greetings from a bunch of um planet or excuse me countries around the planet um like un members from around the planet so that there would be um so that it wouldn't just be an American project, that it would be an international project with buy, global buy-in. And then there are greetings, like I said, in 55 different languages, all saying some form of like, hey, nice to meet you. We're from Earth. Uh, some of them are like, hey, what's the weather like up there? Are you getting enough food? All in these different languages. Um, and then huh. there's a sound essay that sort of goes from the sounds of evolution up through the first tools and domesticating animals all the way up through the launch of rockets. And then oh, the wow. last thing is this like collection of music. And how did they choose the music? See, you asked me only about the music, but I was like, I can't only tell you about the music. I have to also tell you about <laughs> everything else that's on the record. Um, the big idea was this is not just an American project. This is a global project. We're saying not this is what it was like to be American in our time, but this is what it was like to be human on the earth. And so they tried to, um, they went to ethnomusicologists around the world. There are things from, uh, I think every continent except for Antarctica. I don't know if any music has, you know, indigenously come out of Antarctica or not, but, um, they also, so they wanted a representation of the global community. They also wanted, um, Bach and a bunch of classical music because Bach in particular is very mathematical and they kept feeling like math is the language of the universe. Like math is the one thing that should be true everywhere. And so if we present music that has a classical uh, pattern to it, a mathematical pattern that gets followed, the whoever these folks are who find this could be able to know something and find the, you know, find the pattern in the music. Um, so there's pattern recognition, global buy-in and representation of the whole planet. Um, that's, those are the only ones I can remember. I bet there's one or two others that I can't remember. Is it, I read somewhere that, uh, the inclusion of Chuck Berry on the record was kind of controversial. Is that, is that true? Interesting. Um, I don't know the answer to that actually. Um, yeah, I don't know. Huh. If, if yeah, you know was, more about that, please, please tell me. Yeah, I was reading a little bit about it and here I can see if I can find the article real quick, but it was just, it was talking about how, um, some people on the committee weren't a huge fan of having, um, Chuck Berry on there. Because it's rock and roll music? Yeah, so, okay, so this is what uh, Wikipedia says. It says, The inclusion of Barry's Johnny B. Good was controversial, with some claiming that rock music was adolescent, to which Sagan replied, quote, There are a lot of adolescents on the planet. Yes, that's why I love Carl Sagan. It's so good, right? <laughs> He's like, look, that is what it's like to be human. Chuck Berry is a part of yep. the human experience. <laughs> so good, man. Uh, all right, so every episode I ask the same three questions to every guest. Uh, so these are what I like to call the theater threes. Uh, and so the first question of the theater threes is what is your favorite musical? It's, it's gotta be Hamilton. It really, it really does. The storytelling is so good. I mean, the lyric writing, the number of internal rhymes happening in those lyrics, like, Every internal rhyme to me makes um, makes a lyric like yummier and more fun to say. You don't need them. But you can communicate as long as the like ends of the, the lines and the stanzas follow some pattern that helps people get the information. You've done your job, right? But to throw internal rhymes into each of those lines makes every single one of them more fun to say. So you're delivering the same meaning, but more fun. It's like rolls off the tongue better. And he's doing that all over Hamilton, like from start to finish, and the storytelling is impeccable. Like, I remember when my, my younger brother, Keldon, was telling me about it, he's like, you should really look into Hamilton and 
we were driving from New York to Boston one time together and he's like, should I put it on? I was like, sure. Okay. Like I'll give it a shot. You know, I'll, if you say it's good, everyone says it's good. I'm sure it's good. And he plays it. And like, I'm like, this is really good. Wow. The like, cool. These lyrics are really good. And I get a sense of who this guy is and he doesn't want to throw away a shot. Okay. I get it. And then we get to a winter's ball and we meet the Skylar sisters. And then uh, we get to helpless where we see Hamilton and or Alexander and Eliza meet each other. And I mm -hmm. was like, whoa, first of all, this song is so good. It's just so catchy and so good. And I was like, wow, this is really good. The next song is satisfied. And it takes that it takes a different perspective on the scene that we just saw. It rewinds it and shows it from um, from her sister's perspective, from Angelica's perspective. I'm sure you know this, but it was at that moment that I was like, <laughs> something entirely other is happening in this musical that I haven't seen before. Something on a level way beyond what I normally interact with is actually happening here. So it's not just catchy songwriting that's hip hop based, but the storytelling and the insight and the way that this show is structured is just on an entirely other level. So my favorite musical is Hamilton. The second question What's yours? is I'm what? sure you've said this, but can, oh. can I, I, sorry to interrupt you, but I'd love to know what yours is. Boy, uh, man, it, was, like it was meant three. to be a tough question for you, but I know, I know. <laughs> now it's tough for me too. Uh, um, I love Hamilton. I really love um, the musical Come From Away. Oh, I haven't seen um, it yet. I don't know. Yeah, it's, I think they did They did a recording of it. It's on uh, Apple TV, I think. But it's all. Okay. It's about a, a town in Newfoundland called Gander, where on, and it's a true story, on um, September 11th, 2001, when um no planes could you know land in the united states yeah um a lot of planes were grounded in this really small town in newfoundland and they had hundreds of thousands of people you know from hundreds of airplanes uh who all the whole town but um you know, put together all of their supplies and, and opened their homes and hotels and public buildings and everything to help these people, you know, make it through this tough time that they were all experiencing and the sort of uncertainty of it all, you know, if they could get back to the United States mm -hmm. at any time soon. And it's really powerful and it's that perfect mix of you know comedy and and just pure sweetness and it's such a powerful and moving story and as someone who you know was fortunate enough to you know not be alive when September 11th happened it it really does convey the collective trauma that the world went through at that time mm. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that with me. I've, I've heard it and heard of it, and people have definitely suggested that this is a really beautiful show, but I really appreciate your, your insight on that. Yeah, All right, it's so just you wanna, it's really... You want to give me the next question, and I'll answer it, all and you can do that one too? Yes. Are you game to do all, all of them with me? <laughs> sure. Sounds cool. good. So the I usually ask, um, what actor did you look up to? But since you're a composer, what composer did you look up to as a kid and why um paul mccartney was probably number one um i didn't know much about musical theater when i was a kid even when i was acting in some of those shows as a kid um, i've come to appreciate stephen sondheim hugely and uh Rent was the first show I saw on Broadway, and it just oh, you really? know, blew, my, blew my mind. And the appreciation I have for Jonathan Larson, seeing Lin-Manuel's movie Tick, Tick, of Tick, Tick, Boom is just incredible. Um, I, I, I must look up to 
him, Lin Manuel Miranda, probably more than anyone else working right now. Um, I'll mm -hmm. think of somebody here later, but I also really love directors a lot. So Christopher Nolan is a director that who's anything that he makes, I tend to go see. Uh, Ava DuVernay is someone I really look up to, and I see anything that she makes. Um, so those are kind of some heroes. How about you? Uh, as far as far as actors go, I grew up watching the original Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and um, so I have this immense, you know, nostalgia toward Gene Wilder, and oh my gosh. you know, reading more about him, like he was just so dedicated to, you know, being an actor, and when he was sick before he passed away he refrained from letting the public know that because he didn't want the kids who were watching Willy Wonka to know that Willy Wonka was sick so that like wow. I don't know that just it's you know that's just continued dedication to a character even you know I don't it was probably like 2014 when he passed away so you know like a solid you know 40 plus years after you play a character like he's still wow. um, i just want to say something real quick which is that you you're like dedication to this role in a way right to this this role of willy wonka as this like benevolent person looking out for kids and their experience but like he's so menacing towards children in the movie yeah. right all these kids <laughs> die and disappear and everything. uh go, sorry go ahead i didn't mean to cut you off uh and then as i was just gonna say as far as music goes um you know, I've grown up. There's a a group uh, from Arizona, Roger Klein and the Peacemakers. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, I've like my mom. You know, saw a bunch of their shows back when they were first starting out in the '90s, and when they were the the refreshments. And so I've just I've grown up on their music. Oh my gosh, Fizzy Fuzzy Big and Buzzy is such a good album. Yep. Um. I love that one. I like the second one too. Um, and then maybe the first Roger Klein record was Honky Tonk Union. And that one is really, really it good. It was, yeah. Um, Americano. Yeah, I haven't like followed him lately, but I have a huge love for Roger Klein. I've seen him a couple times and loved every time that I've seen him. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's probably my, I've, yeah, just grown up on, on, uh, all of his endeavors. Hell yeah, man. I love that. <laughs> and then the final question of the theater threes is what advice do you have for anyone wanting to get into music or for young musicians and composers? Oh my gosh. Um, the advice is really a question, which is what, do you do what would you do even if you didn't have to so homework you do because you have to and when you start working you work a job because you have to but then you come home and the thing that you want to work on um maybe it's video games but like let's assume that it's something other it's something because you can make a living you can make a career out of video games people do that but what's the thing that you do when you don't have to What's the thing that you do even when you don't get paid for it? Um, and see if you can find a way to get paid for that. Um, that's really a question of, of passion because um, I think it was Howard Thurman, who was a mentor of Martin Luther King Jr., who said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So you doing the thing, Nate, that is specific to you, that lights you up, whether that's, you know, presenting something for theater kids of all ages, whether that's exploring theater, acting in theater, writing, or th something totally unrelated. If it lights you up, that passion, that insight, that is the gift that you offer to the world. So it's the thing that, that's helping you come alive that's most uniquely you. So. I'm also a graphic designer. So in addition to being in Ryan Hood and being a, a folk singer, I'm also a graphic designer. And that's the thing that pays most of my bills right now. But when I do a book cover or 
a logo or something for somebody, I'm not the only person that could do that. Like someone else could make this client a really good book cover that might look the same or it might look different, but it will be good. It'll be high quality. Someone else could make them a logo that would look really good for their business. I'm not the only person that can do that, but I'm the only person that can write Voyagers. I'm uniquely suited to write Voyagers out of my own life experience, my own passion for space, my limited, you know, but obsessive knowledge about science. Um, <laughs> that's my gift. The thing that I can share about that is that's what I should be doing, you know? So if you have something like that in there, that's like, man, after the book cover is done, after the logo is designed, I stay up late researching the golden record so that I can write the song, the next song for Voyagers. Like, and I work on it on weekends and I, you know, get up early to do it. Those things, like be looking for those, even if you don't know how you would make money from them yet. Because what the world needs are people who have come alive. That would be my answer. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's, yeah, that's really, really well put. So thank you yeah, for, welcome. for joining me and for sharing your knowledge and, and your, your project in Voyagers. And, you know, I, I encourage our listeners to go support Voyagers and, you know, donate and help them promote it because it is it's a really amazing project that you're working on it's been a pleasure thanks for having me nate far beyond the atmosphere thank you so much cameron it was an absolute pleasure to speak with you if you'd like to help cameron and saguaro city music theater to workshop this incredible musical you can donate and learn more at the link in the show notes you can also listen to the award-winning music of Ryan Hood and check out their upcoming concerts in the show notes as well. Before we go, I know some of you are like, Nate, what happened to the music you played on the podcast before, bro? And my answer to that is, the music in today's episode is actually from Voyagers, and all of it was performed by Cameron Hood. If you'd like to give any of the Voyagers songs a full listen, visit voyagersproject.com or click the link in the show notes. Oh, real quick, just a quick reminder before the credits roll. I just finished publishing all four editions of Small Business Sundays, which, in case you're not familiar, are the series of articles I published online highlighting a Tucson business each week in May. I spoke with the owners of Melrose Macrame, Sweet Symphony Bakery, Light of Mind Candle Supply, and Urban Fresh. You can read all about their incredible journeys at natewileyproductions.com. Theater Cues is produced by Nate Wiley Productions and me, Nathaniel Wiley, with today's episode featuring music by Cameron Hood from Voyagers, a space rock opera. The songs that you heard in this episode are Matter and The Ballad of One Two. If you like what you hear on the podcast, follow the podcast and check out our website, natewileyproductions.com, for a wide variety of content, from historical series to photo galleries and much, much more. I'll see you in space, Voyagers. So straightforward, like the sun.